Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. So this is our second season of the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast, and I noticed something in our first year, that last year, this episode on Genesis 19 had a steady stream of listeners all year long, and it ended up being in the top 20 downloads of the entire year. And I think that's because there's a burden that many people have over the contents of this chapter, and they're drawn to Genesis 19 because they want to understand what God has said about these heavy topics. So at the outset, let me just say a couple things. First, if there are parents listening with little children, just like yesterday, you might want to listen to this episode first to be sure this is something you want your kids to hear. It's got good stuff, but it's also maybe not for little ears. Second, if you've come to this podcast by way of an internet search, let me just kind of quickly cover what we're doing here. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible, and what we're doing is taking one chapter per day, we're explaining it just straight up so we understand what that passage is saying and how it fits into the overall Word of God. So I haven't chosen this passage because I've got some axe to grind, but because this is the Word of God and we need to know what God says, even in these difficult passages. And we're going to find that often God's eternal, timeless message doesn't fit the spirit of our age, especially in today's day and age. But since this is God's eternal message to us, we will be wise to know it and understand it, and that's why we're studying it today. So with that, hopefully you've already read Genesis 19, and now you're looking to listen to this podcast. And if you have read Genesis 19, then I'd suspect that you probably have a heavy heart having just read this chapter, because this chapter shows us just how vile sin is in the eyes of God and what his judgment looks like. Now, as we've been going through the book of Genesis, these opening chapters have given us a clear picture of man's sin and God's judgment. Back in Genesis 3, we saw God's judgment on Adam's rebellion. In Genesis 4, we saw God's judgment on Cain's murder and lies. In Genesis 6, we saw judgment come upon the wickedness and violence of mankind. In Genesis 11, it came upon the pride and disobedience of mankind. And today, we're going to see in Genesis 19 that God's judgment pours out on Sodom and Gomorrah as burning fire upon the sexual morality that rebels against his design. Now, the judgment of God upon Sodom and Gomorrah actually begins back in chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn there. Genesis 18 comes on the heels of the formation of the covenant between God and Abraham and, and, and ultimately with Abraham's descendants. And, and so going back to Genesis 12, God called Abraham to establish this nation. And in Genesis 18, he's reiterating this promise to Abraham. That he's going to give him a son, but now we're finding it out that this son will be in the next calendar year. And so that means it's go time for Abraham and Sarah. And for the past several chapters, God's been preparing them to establish this nation and now we're going to see the kinds of things that won't be a part of this nation, that can't be a part of this nation. Already we have seen that this would be a nation of people who obey God, and that this would be a nation of people who worship Him rightly, and that this would be a nation of people who walk in His holiness. And so the covenant that God is making with Abraham contains an inherent promise and warning. God's judgment is coming upon the world. God has chosen Abraham to establish this spiritual nation of people who won't experience this judgment. And those who are in covenant with God will be saved from this judgment. And those who are not in covenant with God will face the wrath of God for their sins. And this gives us a window into what that wrath will look like. And so, as the Lord is talking with Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, the Lord says to him, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. And as they talk, it becomes clear that God's going to be bringing judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins. And notice in verse 19, why does God even say this to Abraham? Again, God wants Abraham to know this because Abraham is going to be a patriarch of this new nation, and Abraham needs to know the kinds of sins of Sodom and Gomorrah that will not be a part of the people of God. And so in Genesis 18, 23, Abraham realizes that God is talking about total judgment upon these two cities, and he hopes that there's some way he can dissuade God from this judgment, probably because Lot's living there, his nephew named Lot is living there. And so Abraham gets into this bartering conversation with the Lord. And although this is kind of humorous, it's important for us to see the mercy of God here. And so Abraham says to the Lord, what if there are 50 men righteous? Are you still going to destroy it? And the Lord says in verse 26, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous men within this city, then I will spare the whole place in their account. Well, Abraham's like, what if only 45? God's like, okay, how about 40, 30, 20, even 10? Even 10 people, the Lord said, would be enough to preserve his judgment that's coming upon Sodom and Gomorrah. But we're going to find on out, even that wasn't enough. God's judgment was going to come upon them. Which brings us now to Genesis 19 and the setting for the judgment. In Genesis 19, verse 1, two angels come to the city of Sodom and they find Abraham's nephew named Lot at the city gate. Now, back then, a city gate wasn't like a gate and a fence. Those gates back then were huge and they would sometimes even have rooms in them. 
Often, the city gates was the cultural and commercial hub of the community, and it's even possible that Lot was a city leader because leaders would often sit in the city gates, and here's Lot sitting in the city gates. Either way, for whatever reason, these angels come into the city gate and Lot's there. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 says, Lot was a righteous man. And what we're about to read is going to show us that even God's people can become deluded by the spirit of their age. We're going to see that's completely what's happened to Lot here. And so these angels come into town looking like the average Joe, and, and Lot sees them and he wants to help them and he persuades them to come to his home. Now, Lot doesn't know they're angels. In fact, they're called men throughout most of this chapter here. But these men, these angels agree to stay with Lot and they go to his house. And so while they're at Lot's house, they've eaten, it's getting late, they're getting ready for bed, and suddenly the townspeople start banging on Lot's door and demand that Lot produce these two men, these two angels, for really bad reasons. And verse 4 shows us just how pervasive this is. It says that both young and older wanted this, people from every quarter. Now Lot's horrified by this, and he pleads with them to not do this wicked thing. And in verse 8, he even offers them his two daughters instead. Now, that's shocking and disgusting. Uh, just to even just say this, it, it's obvious. Lot's offer was not okay. And this just shows us again how messed up his moral compass had become and how there can be areas, perhaps even in our own lives, that we think are okay because society tells us they're okay. But we're going to find out, out that we've been duped by the spirit of the age just like Lot was here. And so Lot offers his daughters. Thankfully, the townspeople will have none of that. They do want these men, however, who are really angels. And you can just imagine this chaotic scene, this ride outside of Lot's house here. And, and so the angels pull Lot back into the house and they blind the people in verse 11. Amazingly, these people are so bent on their sin that even though they've been mysteriously blinded, they keep on trying to get in. And then, like a scene from a movie, the angels tell Lot to get his family, pack their bags, and get their loved ones and get going. Now, amazingly, Lot's future son-in-laws don't buy this. They're not going to go with him. And so, therefore, they're going to experience God's judgment with the rest of Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 15, the Lord waits until the next morning. And then in verse 15, it looks like they wake up Lot and they tell him to get going because the city is about to be punished. And amazingly, again, another amazing thing here in verse 16, Lot hesitates. He can't conceive of the kind of judgment the Lord is be bringing upon these cities. And so verse 16 says, but he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion. It's beautiful to see that the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. And in verse 17, the angels tell Lot and his family to run for their lives and don't look back. And then after figuring out where they're going to run to, off they flee. And in verse 24, the Lord then begins to rain down brimstone and fire upon these cities. Now, what's this brimstone? Brimstone's a kind of substance that's on fire. And so this probably looked like something like molten lava raining down in this city. Now, in verse 26, Lot's wife disobeyed the Lord because he had told them back in verse 17 not to look back. And verse 26 says she looks back and she becomes a pillar of salt. Now, that idea of becoming here doesn't mean she became an instant pillar of salt like something out of a Narnie movie. It could just be speaking of being covered in salt. And that was probably a phenomena of this supernatural blast of judgment just kind of sweeping across the plain and enveloping her in it. But the point is clear here. She turned back and she died for it. And in Luke 17, verses 32 and 33, Jesus cites Lot wife as a warning about seeking to preserve our lives that are under God's judgment. We can't. And Lot's wife is an example that God's judgment is coming upon this world. And if deep down we really want what the world offers, well, then we will also participate in this judgment just like her. Now, that's the scene of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But if that wasn't tough enough, then we come to verses 30 to 38 and how Lot's daughters become pregnant by Lot. Now, I personally find this passage just as disturbing as the previous section. And once again, it shows us the depth of sin in Lot's home and how he and his family were so deluded by the world, they had lost their way in walking in the righteousness of God. Even when God tells them what to do, they just can't. And this record here, as uncomfortable as it is, it does give us at least the historical context for the people of Moab and Ammon, who we will see as we go through the Old Testament, they're clearly not a part of the covenant people of God. And so you've just got this very unsettling passage here, both with Sodom and Gomorrah and even with Lot and his daughters. And so Genesis 19 is a rough chapter. What are we supposed to do with this? Well, for one thing, let's allow ourselves to feel the revulsion of sin. The revulsion we feel with this chapter just gives us a window into the kind of revulsion our holy God has for all people's sins. Likewise, this passage gives us a window into the kind of judgment that's coming upon the world. Later in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, it says that anyone's name who is not written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. 
And we can't really envision what that is, except that this passage gives us a window into how awful that judgment will be for those who experience it. This passage also shows us the kinds of behavior that are not going to be a part of the kingdom of God's people. Now, I don't normally tell stories and things like that. These aren't really sermons, but it just is, it's relevant here. Years ago, I was at a large marriage event, and, and outside there was a crowd of, of people protesting it who were, or most of them were, homosexual. They were protesting this Christian marriage event. Now, I didn't understand why they were out there because this event had nothing to do with homosexuality. So I walked on and out to them. I walked up to them, and I asked them, why were they protesting this? And one man shot back. He was just a young man. He said, I just want to know why you hate us so much. Now, I was shocked because literally no Christian hates homosexuals. Now, there are fake Christians who might hate homosexuals, but what we're seeing as we're going through the Word of God is that being in covenant with God means obeying Him, and Jesus calls us to love all people. And so I basically told this crowd, we love you. I don't, what, what's going on? And so they were surprised that I said that. And I said, well, why won't you accept us? Well, with that, I took out my Bible. I had it with me. And I, and I said, let me read a passage to you. And I read to them, if you want to look this up, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And I read to them this passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. And here's what it says. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So I read this passage of this crowd and I said to them, you need to understand, I believe this is true. And rather than hate you, I love you. I'm willing to endure all of this venom you're spewing at me so I can give you God's message so you don't have to spend forever in hell. It's not hate you see, it's love, because I believe you'll be in hell forever because God's word says so right here. But I also believe you can be saved and changed because God also says that right here in verse 11. And I showed them this. And that created a long and profound conversation. These days, people don't want to talk about homosexuals changing. But I can tell you as a pastor, people tell me things in privacy that they would never tell anyone. And over the years, I've met several people who were once fully homosexual, but who are now fully and joyfully heterosexual. And they've told me that they got into homosexuality because they were lied to. It seems that in, in people's younger years, it's not all that uncommon for people to dabble in stuff because they've got raging hormones. And if people dabble in homosexuality, the world tells them they must be homosexual. And so these young people end up believing this message. And even if they don't want to be true, they believe it. And they get caught up into a lifestyle that just makes them increasingly, increasingly miserable. And because of our culture, these, these young people are groomed into a lifestyle. And maybe they like it for a while, maybe they don't. But they can repent of it, just like an adulterer in the same passage here, 1 Corinthians 6. An adulterer may like adultery, but they can repent of that too. And God's grace can bring righteousness and transformation into any person's life who seeks it, who calls upon him to be the Lord and Savior. So I've seen it myself. So in this conversation with this crowd, I was just talking with them about God's love and his call for them to repent. And I think they were shocked because they saw what I was saying and how I said it. And I ended, if you can imagine this, praying with a whole crowd of people, praying with them and for them. And we ended that time having a bit of hope and harmony and even some more understanding of one another. It was a good conversation. And now going back to Genesis 19, because obviously it relates to this, this passage shows us that God's judgment is coming upon these kinds of sins. And we're seeing here, these people don't care. Lot's son-in-laws can't even imagine it. Lot's wife didn't want to leave. And yet the judgment they experience will be experienced by everyone who follows their examples. But we also see that God is a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. He is calling Lot to come out of that world. And he is calling us to come out of this world and the future judgment that awaits it and he is calling us to be in fellowship with him, to be a part of his people. We don't have to live that way anymore. And we're seeing here, these are the kinds of behaviors that won't be a part of God's people. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah were obviously not a part of the people of God. And Lot, while he himself might be with the Lord, we're going to see in the rest of the Old Testament that the people of Moab and Ammon were not in covenant with God and they weren't seeking to obey him. And yet again, this passage shows us God's mercy. I realize it shows us his wrath, but it also shows us his mercy. He was willing to spare these cities if there was even 10 righteous. And he sent angels to examine the situation and he gave them a night to repent before destroying them. And all of this brings us back to the core point of the entire Bible. God loves us and doesn't want us to be embroiled in this soul-destroying sin. And we need a savior and he has promised to send his son to be our savior. Jesus died for the sins of his people, even the sin of homosexuality. 
His love and His grace can overwhelm any sin and any rebellion in our hearts. And yet to receive it, we do need to come to Him. We need to submit to Him and we need to repent and let His Holy Spirit transform our lives. Transformation is not always easy, nor is it always quick, but it is real. And may we all experience His transforming grace. Well, thanks for listening. No matter who you are, please know that God loves you and He calls you to walk in the joy of His holiness. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, have a great day and God bless.